All right, I'm just getting set up here. Is there any audio? Oh, awesome. Thanks. It looks uh, like it's delayed, but...
All right, so I'm looking for this DEF CON video, but uh, I'll get started here. The uh, RISI value on a phone, uh, I guess if you were opening one of your spectrum analyzer programs, you could probably pick up on the, uh, maybe the uplink, I guess you'd say, uh, but I don't see how you tie that to a TIMSI or an IMSI. You probably want to use GRGSM and the IMSI catcher script you could passively collect at least the MZs on GSM phones. There's uh, another program I was looking at. Uh, let's see. I haven't got it working yet, but this MZ catcher for LTE. So that's another option. All right, so I had a few questions about uh, how do I build the ISO and how do you customize it? So the smaller screen here is uh, it's just VMware. Um, I pretty much save all my machines here. It's not anything really that complicated. Um, looks like there's quite a bit of a delay, so I'll slow down. The uh, virtual machine you, you see sitting here is just uh, installed locally here. And um, so if you're on your end and you install DragonOS laptop, VMware, whatever it is that you install it to, you can customize it however you see fit. And if you if you notice if, or if you haven't noticed already under preferences there's the Wolfland Builder. And you use your username and password. This is the tool that I use right now to build the ISO. So the only thing is is you gotta keep it right now I'm trying to figure out how to get around this but right now you have to keep it under four gigs um, so if you were to take the ISO that I have now install it you're really close to that limit so if you remove some programs uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of space is taken up in the uh, sorry in the user source directory <laughs> I keep a lot of, uh, well, pretty much everything there that I've installed by hand. So everyone has the source and can modify it as seed fit. Of course, that takes up a lot of space too. So you could clear that out and then do your modifications, uh, you know, update programs as you see fit. And you should be able to then come over here. You can change the name, the file name. That's what comes up when you boot it up. You can put your URL in there if you wanted, and then you, it tells you right there, uh, at max of four gigabytes, you'd make your ISO, and it will run through here, and by the end of it, uh, you should have an ISO uh, spit out um, that you can then share, and then have your own customized build. So, yeah, that's called Wolfland Builder. I found it a while back. It actually replaced, uh, or it was very similar to Remaster Syst, um, if anyone's familiar with that. Uh, there's another tool out there that can, you can build an ISO for Debian-based uh, images, which is what I used before. I think that was actually called, yeah, I think that's actually called Remaster Syst. Um, so... I just I had questions about that. I just wanted to answer that. Yeah. So yeah, we can do that real quick. Uh, run iperf. I did that the other day, so we'll try that real quick. Uh, although kind of short on. Uh, I actually need two laptops to do that. So. We'll, we'll see if we can do that.
So I'll move this out of the way. That's just uh, for anyone that wanted to take the build that they have installed, customize it, add whatever they want, take away, and then uh, back it up, have an ISO, and then you can redistribute that as you see fit. So that, this is a very long process, so I'll, I'm just going to move this out of the way. So this uh, laptop is sitting next to me here. We're just uh, VNC'd over to the desktop and I have the Lime SDR plugged in. Uh, so the LTMZ catcher, I, I honestly just tried it. Uh, took me a while to figure out how to build it. Uh, I actually, I need to do a video on that. I, I had to download a very old build of SRS LTE to get it to actually build. And the end result was uh, once I told it what frequency to look at, it found a cell, started to break it down, decode it. And um, I'll put that link uh, in here and you can look at it and read about what it's supposed to do. Uh, it's supposed to spit out MZs into a CSV file, but uh, I did not see that happening. And I actually used a frequency uh, that my iPhone was uh, connected to just to see if somehow or another it would... Uh, get my MZ, but I did not see that. Yeah, let's see. So here's this. All right, there's that. Uh, let's see. So in uh, Dragon OS, in the user source, Crocodile, Hunter folder. I've already put everything in there. And all you should need to do is change the config file to your settings, which it would include preferably a wiggle, wiggle uh, account and the API key that you get from there, open cell ID and a GPS puck you know if you have all that configured uh, that's the way it's kind of designed so it knows the location of where you're at then tells uh, Weigel hey I'm in this location what are uh, arsons, arsons and frequencies are available around me it then pulls those down fills out the config.ini file for you that way the radio knows what frequencies to look at and then uh, open cell ID I think is more like of a backup just to verify hey I see these uh, cell IDs and panels around me or towers enobs and then just helps to kind of confirm or deny is this real or is it something that you need to look at further so I have my real information in this uh, config.ini so I won't open that one instead we'll take a look at this example file um, what you want to do is get your API information for uh, the name and the key and then if you optionally the open cell ID key these are what looks like comments you can Remove the comments after crash timeout. Check geographic codes. Uh, that little semicolon, colon. Uh, just delete that and the comment. Otherwise, you'll see some errors pop up. Just do that for everything here. The This is what I wanted to point out to somebody. Uh, if they're watching this after the fact, they were having some issues. If you can't get a connection to the... Wiggle, Weigel 
I think it's Weigel, I don't know, whatever, but if you can't get a connection to there, you're not going to get these uh, Erfsons pulled in, and then your radio is not going to come online. So what you could do is alt, uh, optionally make your own profile, and then specify, just like I've done here, manually specify what's around you. And so if you do that, you could then run Crocodile Hunter like this. You can take a look at the help file. And you could run it. Uh, so I don't have GPS plugged in right now, so I do a dash G, disable G GPS. And if I didn't want to use the uh, API access, you could do a dash W. Uh, but at that point, you're doing everything manually. So let's see. And since this is live, I'm going to try and blank out some of this information since I don't, you know, towers are right around me here. But uh, so let's see. Let's, let's pause it there for a second. So this is the key. You got to have these uh, Urfsons here. Uh, otherwise, it's. Uh, Oh, now I messed it up, but it's not going to bring the radio online. Oh, the other thing, I forgot about that. You probably want to do a dash uh, D so that you can actually see what's going on. Okay, so see the radio is starting. This is the Lime SDR. Now it's going to start going through and looking at all the various uh, frequencies. I only really have like one cell that it... it maybe one or two that it picks up around me here uh, but the radio will be running in the background and if you had noticed up here it tells you the IP and the port to go to and of course there's some <laughs> information there but uh, this was just a project I ran in the past uh, let's see, small version of Lime SDR. Yeah, it's like, I think it's the less than $200 one. Lime SDR Mini. There's two, two cellular antennas on it. And uh, so if you had that set up and you had a GPS puck on it, ideally you'd drive around with it, do a survey, and then you'll begin to see the you you start plotting the E node B and uh, the cells uh, on the map and if you did that over time the theory is uh, or not the theory but the whole point of it is you'd begin to figure out where the cell panels uh, towers are at and if you uh, saw something moving or uh, hey it was here at this time in the month now it's here that that's the whole thought process behind it is would help you identify like hey this uh, this is maybe something I need to look at. Maybe this is a rogue BTS. Yeah, so. Uh, it's kind of hard to show this stuff without, like, 
pointing out ex exactly my my information here and what's around me. I prefer not to do that, but uh, uh, you know, hopefully, if somebody has a Lime SDR Mini, you got a GPS puck. You only need a couple things, laptop, and you should be able to be up and running with this. They're still working on it. Uh, you can add uh, known towers to the map, and this is all saved in a SQL uh, database. So you can have multiple projects and open each one and come back to it after the fact. So, All right. Uh, if nobody has any questions on this, I think I'll move on to something else. Alright, so something else I thought I'd take a look at. Uh, I think it was actually Let's see. Yeah, so the Raspberry Pi, I guess the only thing is uh there'd probably be a lot of time to a lot of the a lot of the programs I, I think are not even working yet on the Raspberry Pi, but I'll definitely take a look at that. I have a uh, what is it called a Latte Panda sitting over here, uh, and because it was x86 64-bit, uh, it runs Dragon OS uh, pretty well. Um, some things don't work, but I actually have it booted up over there. Uh, I just didn't get time to uh, link it in for this video. So something I haven't. Uh, taken a look at before but it is included in Dragon OS is uh, both the Zigbee and 802.11 uh, uh, via GNU radio oh yeah that, okay so let's see how can we do this um, So I did, uh, I did a video yesterday, if you take a look at the very end of it, I set up, uh, I actually had two laptops, one was acting as the 4G LTE base station, and the other, the other uh, laptop was acting as the handset, because I don't have uh, SIM cards to program right yet, uh, and or phones to go along with it, so SRS LTE comes with uh, the ability to run uh, a software defined radio as the as the handset so I had that set up I had the handset communicating with the uh, base station and then I just put iperf on uh, each end and did a uh, iperf client server I think it hit like over 13 meg or so um, from the phone to the base station and then I actually added the ability to get out to the internet as well so simulating as if the phone had uh, 4G, or, you know, actual data. So last night I was messing with uh, GNU Radio, and I was trying to figure out this uh, Zigbee, thinking that I could use something else to detect it. And what I figured out is, let's see, if you want to run this, you first need to open up the let's see yeah let's see oh yeah GR phosphorus I'm not sure if this one the laptop that I'm actually using to control the stream would have been really nice for that it has like a actually I've ran it on there it has like a 4 gig NVIDIA uh, graphics card in it and it does the GR phosphorus really well I don't know if this other laptop has uh, I can take a look but if you want to run the Zigbee 
uh, flow graph or the transceiver flow graph, you need to first open this flow graph. And it'll come up and look like this. And then you generate the flow graph, which then you can see it saves it here in the home directory. And I, I didn't really understand that at first. I was just opening the transceiver flow graph and I was missing a block. So you need to run that first. And then you can run the, let's see. You can run the transceiver flow graph, and I unplugged the Lime SDR, and now I have this USRP B205 Mini plugged in. And you'll see it'll come up uh, defaulted like this with some blocks uh, turned off and the packet pad turned on. So if we disable this and we enable the USRP source and sync, as well as the message strobe. Uh, it should be, let's see, maybe I could plug in a hacker F. Let's see. By the way, how is it over there in uh, Germany? All right, so we got the HackRF plugged in too. And if I enable this uh, flow graph, or if I execute the flow graph, Save it to the desktop. Rain 13 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I've uh, been over to uh, Germany before. Really nice. All right, so I actually met the uh, OpenWRT guys uh, in Berlin. That was a really long time ago. Oh, nice. National holiday. All right, so it's uh, it's going to take a second because it's loading the uh, FPGA and firmware for the B205 Mini. You'll see it starting up. So I don't have a whole lot of experience with Zigbee. I know it's uh, broadcasting here on 2.48, so I guess what we could do is, uh, let me think. chip. I need to look that up. Well, what is that used for? Is that... Yeah, okay. Yeah, Osmo Com BB. I, I I need to get into that. I've been reading about that, but I don't have the phones or anything to try that. So I don't know if that's the DC spike or let's see. Yeah. Let's see. There is the game game. Uh, 
trying to find the uh, oh yeah maybe you'll maybe you'll beat us to 5g Two point four eight. So okay, maybe this is it then. All right, so I'll be honest, not as knowledgeable on the uh, SIGB or this flow graph, but as far as I can tell, I just have to look at that more. That's at least getting that up and running with the USRP radio here. Trying to think what else can we take a look at. What I need help with, though, is uh, uh, I've been trying to get this... So let's see, I'll plug the LIME SDR back in. I've been trying to get the uh, network in the box scripts working with Asterix. And if anyone knows how to fix it, I'd be uh, really happy to take a look. Let's see. So something else included in here in the user source. Network in the box scripts is the ability to. So I've have a Lime SDR plugged in. Uh, if you take a look at the files in here, you can see what it's doing uh, and where I've placed the configuration files to make this possible. Uh, what I can't figure out is, and I think it's something right in here. You're, you're able to uh, send GPRS to the phone, and you can see if you look real closely in here, it's doing the IPv, uh, the IP forward, and post routing and masquerading. I, need, I think I need to take a look in there because uh, it's not actually sending data to the phone. So if you did, for example, You take a look, you can um, set it up to where it's automatically interactive. So when a phone, I'll go ahead and turn one on, uh, connects to it, it'll get a text message. Uh, I wanted to be able to have data on the phone. So you could set up this base station and then to the user it would look as if they had data and they could go out um, to an actual website. And then the... Uh, Asterisk support, that's where I've taken a look at that and it looks like when you're running it, with, at least with this old script and the way it's scripted out, it's not building the outgoing call correctly. So I don't know, that's one thing I gotta figure out. So really the only thing that works is if you do This here and what it should do is find the Lime SDR mini for you automatically and now it's broadcasting um, GSM and so if I if I just say if I turn on one of these phones here which I don't I don't care so much about this MZ these are throwaway SIM cards here. Let's see. Here in a second, you should see 
the phone connect. And there it is. So uh, that phone's connected. You can see the MZTMZ, the extension that the scripts gave to it. And then on that phone, I got a text message uh, that was uh, already pre built in the configuration file. And if you have control of the phone, you can then take a look at some of the other options. Ah. That config.json file. see what it sends by default for an SMS, USSD, and then what I really want to get working is this call ability so somebody would um, connect to the network, immediately receive a call with a pre-canned uh, voice message. Oops. And let me see here. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, 3G to for the 3G, 2G BTS swap. Yeah, I was kind of surprised there's still GSM uh, over here. And then the upgrade window. No, so I don't have anything built in uh, that would upgrade from one thing to another. That's literally just the default. Uh, Lubuntu 20.04 uh, update uh, notification that'll pop up. So I, I think for the most part, I it's probably safe to upgrade. I my fear would be if there was a big change in um, GNU Radio or something like that that might break things. But that's just uh, straight. Uh, let's see. Let's see what pops that up here. One of these here uh, causes that to happen, and it, it's it's the same thing as if you just did and so I have it set on just a particular kernel right now, but if you wanted to get that updated. And then you can see it will uh, start to get back on track with keeping the uh, kernel up to date. Uh, but I have seen issues, you know, with certain kernels here and there. Something might work on one and then not on another. Yeah, there actually is a, I'm trying to think of what that's called, a Wi Fi card. Um, I can't really think of it right now. I have I have an Ubertooth sitting here uh, for a Bluetooth, but I cannot think of what that um, one radio is that, yeah, sorry, I can't think of it right now. Uh, let me think, how do we, so the GR Phosphorus, What do you run? Let's see, let's take a look at GR Phosphorus. I don't know if I can do that on here. Wait till this finishes. Well, so I do have an alpha card here, but it doesn't, uh, I, I don't, 
I don't know of anything that would uh, make it be more of um, any, anything outside of just looking at the typical Wi-Fi channels. I thought it was something like crazy, crazy radio, or uh, I can't remember. And it's actually been a while since I did the GR philosophy. Actually, this doesn't even this doesn't even have an Nvidia in it. Do you for your on your end there? Is it Caitlin? Am I saying that right? No, there's no either. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to. So, I don't have the Intel uh, dev packages to install right now for that. So, I'm totally open. Um, anything else you can think of to cover? This whole live thing is a lot harder than I thought. Um, having everything kind of staged and figured out beforehand. <laughs> What I really wanted to get working was the uh, the newer Sig Digger uh, has a analog TV viewer built into it, and so if you take the HackRF, oh yeah, doesn't. Seemed like it would be exciting last night in my head. And then I got up and thought, wow, maybe it won't be as exciting just listening to me talk. <laughs> so I've got a Hack RF. I have just the straight standard um, telescopic antenna that comes with the RTL SDR. And I have a, oh, actually, that's not even going to work because uh, this is 5 gigahertz. So. Uh, I have one of these antennas um, that looks like a flower bloom looking thing and it's uh, 5 gigahertz as well so if I put that on here and what should happen is We've got the Hack RF. We'll take the crank this up the uh, bandwidth and sample rate. And if we take a look at uh, 5 gigahertz, yeah, actually. That's one thing I don't have is the porta pack. I'd like to get hands on that. Where is this? There we go. So that's the analog video feed. So this is what this 5 gigahertz FPV camera looks like in the spectrum. And if we widen this out,
and you open it in an ins inspector tab with uh, FSK it's kinda hard to see here Okay, so I don't know why the window opens like that, but if we bump up these bits here under the clock recovery, hit start, and see it here. So I used to do it like this and I could make out the video and yeah I'd be curious to see if you had like a directional antenna 5 gigahertz um, how far away you could pick this up but I used to do this and then now under analog TV this tab has been added and so it's NTSC I just haven't quite figured out how to oh wow okay so that's much better than I've seen in the past you might just have to manually adjust and this is where it gets a little confusing for me but um, I'm sure there's a way to get a clean picture in here I just don't know enough about all these different uh, fields and options I do know however if I open up SDR Angel so this might be what you want to use. You open up SDR Angel and this is the 4.16.1 that kind of made a pretty significant change here where the layout looks different here. You, you add channels over here on the right now. It's a little confusing. You find your uh, input up here in the upper left hand now. We've got the HackRF. You come over here to the channels now that used to be over on the left add an ATV demodulator and I think it was I have something Actually, now I don't remember what it was. So, right here, if you open this up,
Oops. Oh, sample rate. There we go. Now it's going to make me out to be a liar here. Well, I could end up spending the rest of the day on this, but I've definitely seen it uh, have a crisp, clean picture. I'm probably just forgetting what I did now. This is. Also received the DV BS2 from the LMP. Uh, let me think. Satellite to you. Oh, uh, so. How did I do that? DVB is two. Ah. All right. Well, I promise you can get a clear picture here. Now I got to look at it later. I just had to refer to my video where I set it up before. Oh, there we go. Told you it works. Okay, so let's see. Uh, satellite TV. The only thing I can think of is I'm trying to think where is that at. DV, what did you say? You said DVB is two. I think it's in DTV. Does any of this look like? what you're asking for. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I thought I did broadcast. How could I do that? I thought I broadcasted uh, an example file with one of these flow graphs and then you can receive um, 
what's that called? SDR Angel has uh, blocks to receive. Yeah, D DTV, I think it was, or D. Matter of fact, I think I used an SDR play to receive. Right here, DATV demodulator. Yeah, I thought. So I think this is the only thing that SDR Angel has, DVB S and then DVB S2. Ah, oh, gotcha, okay, over the satellite. Yeah, I just I just used one of these flow graphs here, DVB, whichever one it was, and generated a file and uh, received it with there. Yeah, see if you, because I don't, the only thing, we, I could probably really receive over here is maybe this ATSC, but I've not seen that work like real time. I got to figure that out. I think I can tune and capture and then play back later with VLC or something, but I haven't actually captured it live. Uh, I don't know. What else can we take a look at? And there you go, you got all your specifically calling out Germany here. But these, most of these flow graphs are, you can see they're pulling from a file source to then. Um, either play or broadcast it out. Yeah, I mean, I could be wrong. The way I'm looking at it is because at the end of it here, you got the USRP sync. Oh, yeah, Sparrow Wi-Fi. So... I've got the HackRF sitting here already, 5 gigahertz antennas attached, Bluetooth in another port, or I mean uh, the Ubertooth in another port, plus the laptop itself has Bluetooth adapter and Wi-Fi. So if you look into user source, Yeah, so if we start up Sparrow Wi-Fi, there's actually two pieces to it. There's uh, an agent and then the actual server side, I guess you'd say, uh, that I've shown. You can run the Sparrow Wi-Fi agent on a Raspberry Pi or, or something else um, and have it remotely out somewhere and then through a network connection feeding back to the interface that I'm pulling up right now, which is just Sparrow-Wi-Fi. I think, does it have... Let me see. I, just, I thought maybe it had some options, but Python 3 will start it up. And so, if you look under... Bluetooth, uh, you can use the Bluetooth to do discovery and or you could look at just the spectrum. So uh, let's say we do the Ubertooth to look at 2.4 here overlaid on top of the channels and then 5 gigahertz on the Hacker F, which that is that spike is probably this analog or uh, drone camera so if I unplug it yeah all right so that's what that is and then you can see wireless access points and whatnot communicating here 
And then if you I'm trying to think how I can do this, uh, the problem is if I hit scan right now, it's going to be revealing all the MAC addresses and SSIDs around me. So what will happen is you hit scan, it'll plot everything out here under the MAC address vendor, and then uh, I'm, I'm pointing at the screen as if you could see what, what I'm doing, but the, uh, the bottom left area, the 2.4 gigahertz, uh, is there a link to Wireshark? So, uh, I, I don't think that this is tied into Wireshark in any way, but if you do look at the blue uh, Sparrow Wi-Fi page, um, the person that's like developing this out has added the ability to tie this into uh, Amazon. I get this mixed up. I think it's the last to search. So, oh, can you see the packets and frames? I don't think it's it's not like a Kismet. Um, it, it's not doing like a packet capture and stuff. It, it's using like IW config tools or IW list or whatever. And um, so with this, you're only essentially doing like scans to find access points. So pretty much just like the apps on your phone or or whatever. So it's I, I don't it doesn't go um, in depth as uh, Kismet does. So you're not going to see the clients associated to the access points. Uh, you're not going to see the you know things probing for SSIDs and things like that. This will just get you the uh, access point scan itself, at least for Wi-Fi. And then the Bluetooth, that might be, that's a whole other thing. So that might be more of like, hey, doing uh, Bluetooth low energy with the Ubertooth and or the normal just Bluetooth with the wireless inside. And then it's got a whole other section. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think what this will do. So you can specify the scan type here depending on what adapter that you have and then you can do a scan and you get the RISI values estimate a range from you if you have GPS uh, hooked in and um, yeah so it'll export it to KML file KML KMZ I think it is uh, or CSV and then you can use that uh, maybe to overlay on Google Maps or something. Yeah, so you can create an access point map and an SSID map from the telemetry. So, and then this part, uh, the tools for RFID, that I, I don't know, I haven't messed with anything yet RFID related. So, yeah, sorry, I don't, uh, I'm sure there's probably something in here. It seems like there's so many tools and so many different things that you can do. Um, are you familiar with, you're probably familiar with Kismet, right? Oh yeah, that's another thing. Somebody was asking me if they've watched the video this far. I don't even know how long we've been going here, but uh, uh, if you run... Okay, so Kismet... You'll see I've ran it quite a few times here, and wherever you run it from the command line, that's where the log files are going to be generated at. But uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, let me think before I start it. So it can use, I have Ubertooth plugged in. I can take the HackRF out of the equation here. It can work with the RTL SDR dongle. And if you have, which Dragon OS does, if you have RTL 433 uh, built in, it can take advantage of that. So RTL 433 will get you uh, quite a few devices in like the 433 megahertz. Uh, you can see it's a pretty lengthy list that the guy has uh, available. It's what's it up to now? It's It looks like roughly 167 devices all the way from security home security systems to 
weather station devices, uh, tire sensors, you name it. And you can actually you can actually run that outside of uh, Kismet itself and use it with more than just the RTL. Oh, good, yeah. So RTL four three three is uh, available in Kismet. So Kismet will start up and then it'll run on the local host uh, twenty five oh one. First time you start it up, you'll create your uh, username or yeah, yeah, username and password. Now, one thing I might be able to show you, let's see, because Kismet added a new feature where you can uh, blank out uh, MAC addresses so if you're doing a demonstration. I'm just trying to remember what it is here. Yeah, it's a new feature called Sensor Max. If you come up here and you change this to sensor max equals one we'll find out real fast here in theory it should blank out all the mac addresses so maybe just to be safe i'll You can You can put on manufacturer frequency, uh, other information here. give it a shot so come over here data sources you can see uh, I've got the both the uber tooth the normal Bluetooth I can activate the Wi-Fi and then one of three options for the RTL 433 or I'm sorry for the uh, RTL SDR uh, ADSB is pretty cool it works really well if you turn that on it actually has its own little map here if you give it internet can't run on, run on. So nothing in here for deck, uh, but the Wi-Fi. So if I enable, so you can pull in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and then say you did uh, RTL four three three. Then you can sort by what devices uh, you want to see as they become available. So right now I'm just looking for RTL 433. I should be able to Bluetooth. Usually there's like some weather sensors around me, um, but uh, anyway, so that uh, that's pretty much uh, Kismet. You can do uh, a wide variety of feeds into one central location. You can set up uh, Kismet remote on um, various uh, devices uh, externally and then feed it back into this one uh, common interface here. And this can also be tied into GPS. <laughs> and go figure, there's all the, the uh, MAC addresses. So I'll have to clean this up, but this is what's hard about uh, being live and doing something like this. So in the user source, there is GR Deck. Uh, I just don't have any devices to test this with.
if you look under uh, the director I'm in, user source GR deck to GRC, and you say have the HackRF, you can um, you can do. I almost I think it was like fifteen dollars on eBay. I was looking at a uh, baby monitor that was specifically mentioned on the GR deck website. Uh, I was just going to order it just to understand how it actually worked. I know there's another video out there, or a couple of videos I think that, that YouTuber, YouTube person's signals anywhere has put together. Uh, but this is actually updated uh, to use GNU Radio 3.8. Uh, and the you know everything looks to be working. So if you do the new radio and then deck two, I think it was HackRF. I, I fixed the flow graph. Come here, got HackRF, and the little terminal window I think does work. Pops up. Specify the carrier number, and then down in this box area you should see the ones and zeros or whatever else is there if you actually in fact had a de uh, the right kind of deck and it wasn't encrypted then my understanding is you could uh, listen to it so well I think uh, I've used up about an hour here um, this is kind of a learning experience, so I think next time I'll probably have uh, more uh, topics uh, figured out beforehand. <laughs> oh, you were actually able to try it. Okay, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to see how it actually works. Um, and yeah, just to I guess close it out. You can see that what we started with, which was building the ISO, if you take it all the way to the end and you didn't go over four gigs on what you um, were trying to shove in on your own custom build, you then will end up with this telling you, hey, the ISOs or the ISO and the MD5 files are in the home Wolfland Builder, Wolfland Builder, and then you can find your ISO in there, download it burn it to USB with Etcher and there you go you have your own custom uh, copy of uh, Dragon OS or go forth and do great things making it you know better tweaking it more to what you want in it and uh, yeah all right well thank you that was uh, pretty interesting I think we got most things working so hope you all have yeah let's see yeah the DF project uh, hey thanks uh, the and thank you uh, why, why did you not use the standard uh, so uh, let me think so the DF project um, yeah I actually had some somebody volunteer but it's probably gonna take me i um, gonna be pretty busy for a little while so maybe maybe two weeks from now um, I had someone <clears throat> volunteer to set up uh, Kerberos SDR, I think that's what you're talking about, the Kerberos SDR, uh, on a building, um, and then I, I, I prepackaged it up so it has a zero tier on it, and then the idea is it would just be stationary, and then we'd pump the DF, uh, or the lobs back to RDF mapper, and, um, but ideally I wanted someone that could have like three of these devices, three of these things set up, and then simultaneously D DF back to RDF mapper. That's probably going to take a little longer, but at least it's kind of moving moving along. And then um, I didn't use the standard Ubuntu because I wanted to try and start with something as small as possible. Um, because in order to fit, all, I mean, there's like two different versions of, as an example, SRS LTE in there, which, and I've left the source, so that takes up 100 megabytes or 100 meg or so, and just all the other various programs 
Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it would have quickly, I wouldn't have been able to fit as much. So that was kind of the thought process behind that. I'm actually trying to figure out ways to condense down what's in there to fit more programs and or figure out, I kind of know where it's at. I just need to test it. That limit of uh, about four gigs should be able to take that up higher. I just actually have to test it. Uh, yeah, in interference on loss. That'd be great if um, if you were open to, I don't know if you have Kerberos SDR devices or if we spoke, but um, if you were willing to get them all set up and then you know, maybe we work together, I could feed it back uh, here into RDF Mapper or show you kind of how that would work. So, yeah, maybe if you could, if you could at least get two, and you could set them up up a little higher, two different locations. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be a, a problem. And I think the, I think they're going to start selling them again if they haven't already. I know the price like went through the roof. Opera, opera cake. I need to look that up. I haven't heard of that. Opera cake. Um, yeah, if you get another one and could set them up, we could maybe generate laws from two different locations on whatever. But the thing is, though, if you're talking finding interference, I'm assuming the interference would be not intermittent because I don't, I don't think it would do very well on just an intermittent somebody transmitting something. Yeah, that would be that'd be really interesting. It's just kind of cumbersome right now with I, I think the new versions of the the Kerberos, the version two they were talking about in the forum would have where you di wouldn't have to like unhook and hook the antennas uh, back up when you're doing the uh, when you're syncing it basically. But whatever, I, I don't think it throws it too far off. You could uh, probably have the antennas hooked up and then tweak it remotely based on whatever frequency that you were looking for uh, even with the older Kerberos that'd be pretty interesting if somebody was transmitting for long enough and you had multiple angles uh, DFing at the same time I, you know in theory you should be able to the only problem is RDF mapper doesn't really uh, like save a history you'd have to be like recording it as you're doing it to kind of play it back because it just every new lob that comes in on a particular device overwrites the old one so you don't you know what I mean so yeah I couldn't imagine it would work out well driving around um, tens for very fast actually you know what I think I did hear of that opera cake thing um, but I don't know if there was any. I, I don't remember seeing any software or anything else to go along, to go along with it. Uh, I, I don't know. I'll look at that. It, yeah, I guess. Uh, so I imagine the COVID nineteen thing probably didn't help uh, progress out. But the um, my understanding they were going to have the. RTL SDR people would have probably had some software, or maybe they are working on software that would uh, kind of take what uh, RDF Mapper has done and you know and improve upon that. But uh, yeah, we should. There's there's some other software I know that people are working on out there. Uh, I just don't think it's public for uh, the RTL SDR, or I'm sorry, the the Kerberos. But I guess if you had your main server set up. And your main display running, say for example, RDF Mapper to get started, and then you, like you said, you have the city uh, internet, and you had the devices out. Uh, I mean, heck, you could probably use various different forms of networking or VPN or whatever to get it back. I just use zero tier real quick. Uh, put zero tier on the server, zero tier on the Either the if you're running it in a stationary location and you don't want to use uh, the, the have the phone there with it, 
then you have to probably configure your array in such a way where antenna one was north and, and, and have it more in a stationary setup. And there's a Python script that you can put on the Pi and then that uploads the bearings to RDF mapper. Um, I don't know, there's probably several different ways, but uh, that'd be pretty cool to set that up. And uh, not not sh not sure about firmware upgrade for the RTL SDR. I'll, I'll look at that. I I saw on the RTL SDR page something about um, new new drivers that somebody had kind of come up with or improved on some things, but. I'm not sure about a firmware upgrade. I'll look at that though. Um, but um, I think, man, I can't really think any anything else. I'd love to set up that DFing thing though. That sounds pretty cool.